God help me through it, help me get through it all It don't matter what the problem is as long as you're involved And them giants might be big, they may be scary, may be tall But no matter what the situation, giants gotta fall hey. Saul's sons were Jonathan, Ishvi, and Malkaishua. The name of his older daughter was Mirab, and that of his younger was Mihai. Jesus, who this woman? She's a woman who's very self-possessed. Impressionable, very much in love, willing to risk everything. And she representing the proud house of Saul. The manipulator. She represents the type of person that is so connected to tradition. She had a broken heart. She was disappointed. She felt rejected. But she's strong. And she's passionate. And it's not every woman in the, in the Bible that you get to see their passion. So after a lot of research and a few more years than I'd like to admit, I am so pleased to announce that I have an idea of what the Lord was talking about that day. And I, I reluctantly say I have an idea because we don't fully, you know, no 100% gets it. If you do, let me know, because I really would like to tap your brain. However, um, I didn't know it at the time, but asking that question, who this woman, really shoved me down the path that I know now is called spiritual formation. And it's because of my love for this understanding of the growth process that I was so excited to tell Mihail's story. But then I started thinking, is her story something that only resonates with me? She's not the typical Bible heroine that we're all used to hearing about, you know. It didn't turn out, the ending of her story didn't turn out so great. It's, we didn't get the miracle. We didn't get the hallelujah, praise God moment that we're so used to celebrating and reading about. And then I started thinking, what if this is, you know, she's encompassed with David. What if this is just a story? No, there's no such thing as just a story. Everything is, um, it's funny, like there's a, um, sometimes there's a, there's an expression actually, I can't remember what verse it's on, but like where it says, this verse calls out Darsheni, like this verse calls out, interpret me, right? But I think every story calls out Darsheni, right? Every story calls out, interpret me. So many have asked me, why did you choose this story? Um, and I sat there and I thought about it very long time and I tried to come up with a spectacular answer, but I know in my heart that I didn't choose this story. This story chose me. I know now that I have been granted the responsibility to share these stories on this platform. So how was I going to tell a story in an hour? What took me years to understand? Well, I'm glad you asked, because I have a lot of help. By tracking down experts from a variety of disciplines who rarely, if ever, talk to each other. Then the best part about it is none of them necessarily agree 100% with what I got out of the story. And they don't agree with each other at some times. However, they each possess a crucial piece of the puzzle that will challenge even the most avid Bible reader. So you know that old joke about the priest, the minister, and the rabbi all walking into a bar? Well, hold on to your seats. We're about to find out what happens when a biblical counselor, a theologian, a worshiper, a storyteller, a reverend, and a rabbi all walk onto a screen. But before we get to the results of knowing the story, let's slow it way down 
and go right back to the beginning. We have David, and there's a lot of appellation. He's David Ben Yishai, David, son of Jesse. He becomes David Melech Israel, David, king of Israel. Samuel, Shmuel, which means God heard. And then you have Shaul, Saul, Shaul HaMelech, King Saul. And then you have his daughter, who was known actually as Michal Bat Shaul. Michal, the daughter of Shaul. Michael, in the book of Samuel, she appears in a number of different places. Uh, for example, 1 Samuel chapter 18, and 1 Samuel 19. She appears in I mean, 2 Samuel chapter 3 and also in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Okay, those are the main places, apart from some genealogies and the like, where she appears, where there are stories in which she's a character. And each of those chapters have fit into a larger framework of the stories in the book of Samuel. And so you have to know what's happening in particular in that particular spot, but then how that story fits into a larger circle of stories that appear in the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, which are really just one story. That is an amazing Old Testament story about the journey between a man and woman. A woman who initially fell in love with this, uh, I'm gonna just say tall, dark, and handsome guy. You know, I, I never saw David, but I'm sure there was something attractive about him that just kind of made him breathtaking to Michael. I think she's an interesting character. So in one part of the story, we see that she's an assistant to David. Like, she's the reason why his life gets saved. And so, you know, she helps him uh, escape. She covers for him. This is the epitome of love. She was the wife of David, young David. David, the musician. David, the um, Goliath killer. David, the powerful young man who came into Saul's household and should have been a hero, and he was, to absolutely everybody but Saul. Saul saw him as a threat, and so he wanted to be done with this young man one way or the other. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with David but had departed from Saul. So he sent David away from him and gave him command over a thousand men, and David led the troops in their campaigns. In everything he did, he had great success because the Lord was with him. When Saul saw how successful he was, he was afraid of him. But all of Israel and Judah loved David because he led them in their campaigns. David, Ben Yishai, appears on the scene. He gains the notice of Shaul, of the king, because he's this little kid who beheads Goliath, the Philistine, Haplishti. So Shaul wants to know who he is. Shaul wants him to become part of his household, but very quickly he becomes jealous of him. And so he, he has him lead, like serve at the front of the battle so that he'll die, but he doesn't die. He instead becomes even more beloved by the people because he's, he's out in front. And Shaul sees that God is with him and fears him. Saul said to David, here is my older daughter Mirab. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of the Lord. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise a hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. But David said to Saul, who am I? And what is my family or my clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So when the time came for Mirab, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Adriel of Mahala. There's like this sense of keep your, keep your enemies closer. <laughs> he wants to make him part of his family. So he promises him his eldest daughter. And then Midrash has different, like the, the interpretations try to come solve what, what happened, why it was that suddenly uh, Merav promised to David, but then Merav gets married to someone else. But it turns out like Michal's in love with David all along. Now Saul's daughter, Michael, was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased. When David refused to marry his older daughter, then he found out that Michal, his younger daughter, a princess as it were, daughter of a king, was in love with David. 
Sadly, when a young woman is in love, not just interested in, not just casting an eye at, she loved David. And because of that, she was willing to do anything. Uh, well, one of the th things that stands out, First Samuel uh, chapter 18, I think verse number 20, is the only place in the Bible where it tells us a woman loved a man. And it was Michael who uh, loved David. And, uh, and so uh, with that in mind, there must have been some real love there at one time at least. And, and I think there was, you know, we, we pretty much have the story that, that Michael on the inside of Saul's household protected David while Jonathan protected him on the outside. Uh, and so I think, you know, things started out really good, but along the way, they, Saul stepped in and, and, and messed a lot of things up. I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him. So Saul said to David, now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. He earns the right to have Michael as his wife by Saul telling him, I'll let you have her if you'll bring me a hundred foreskins of Philistines. And so David goes out and kills a bunch more than that and brings a pile of Philistine foreskins. And for that reason, he gets Michael as his wife. Okay, so what Michael is pretty much a functionary in that story. She's not really active in it. She's just sort of being pushed around by these men. If you want a story that talks about women being pushed around by men, there's one. Saul's being characterized there as somebody who is, again, a failing king, a wicked king. And in fact, the writer of Samuel actually says there that the reason he did this was because Saul thought that the Philistines would kill David and he was trying to get rid of him. When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and that his daughter Mihail loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy for the rest of his days. And it happened as they were coming. When David returned from killing the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. And the women answered one another as they played and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And Saul was very wroth, and the saying displeased him. And he said, they have ascribed unto David ten thousand, and to me they have ascribed but a thousand. And what can he have more but the kingdom? And Saul eyed David from that day forward. You know, the interesting thing about Saul is that the only credentials he had for being king was he was tall. And but you know, that's what the scripture said. He stood up and he didn't call them and he did And uh, And obviously, he didn't do those things very well. Michal's love for David, I think, frightens Shaul even more. David and Jonathan have like this really, really, Jonathan and David have this beautiful, beautiful friendship. And Michal is also deeply in love with him. So it's like, Shaul feels, you know, Saul feels the, the ground moving under his feet from the fact that these people are so, that his children are so, not only is God moving his love from David, from, from, from him to David, but also his children love David more than they love him. And we see both children actually betray their father in favor of David. Once more, war broke out, and David went out and fought the Philistines. He struck them with such force that they fled before him. But an evil spirit from the Lord came on Saul as he was sitting in his house with his spear in his hand. While David was playing the lyre, Saul tried to pin him to the wall with his spear, but David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 19 is where Saul is persecuting David, and Michael is a very active person because he's, David is beginning to flee from Saul. Saul sent men to David's house to watch it and to kill him in the morning, but Mihail, David's wife warned him, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. She sends him out the window, down a rope, running for his life. 
and she puts an idol in their bed, which must have been of a pretty good size because the guys who came for David, for a moment anyway, were convinced that was him. That was risky for a young princess, but she did it out of love for and a desire to protect David. She's supporting David, who's the upcoming king of Israel. And she's doing that in defiance of her wicked father, Saul. So you can begin to see that she moves from being a functionary to somebody who's actually opposing her um, father, the wicked Saul. And uh, so she's active there, actually, like Jonathan, uh, opposing Saul. When Saul sent the men to capture David, Mihail said, he is ill. Then Saul sent the men back to see David and told them, bring him up to me in his bed so that I may kill him. You know, she makes it look as though there's a person in the bed and when the, the messengers come for him, she says, I'm sorry, he's sick. And they leave. <laughs> but ultimately Saul sends them back um, and discovers the idol and that it's not David, but it's too late. David has escaped because of Michal. Saul said to Michal, why did you deceive me like this and send my enemy away so that he escaped? Michal told him, he said to me, let me get away. Why should I kill you? She deceived her father and let David escape, obviously because she was in love with him. But quickly, and, and as, as a psychologist, this is a good study, quickly she turns and says to her father, hey, well, he was terrible to me. You know, he, he was a guy that nobody wanted to be around. You talk about manipulation. Here, here's a woman who has learned the concept of manipulating somebody, right? So, yeah, so she's kind of an interesting study. Yeah, because on one hand, you say, oh, honey, that's good, you're helping this guy. On the other hand, she, she's saying, hey, I hate this guy. Man, you should never marry me. You see what I'm saying? And, and so, yeah, boy, she's some kind of good. Because then she, she'd make a pretty good study. <laughs> I can't give Michael a bad rap because she's the sister and I don't know her journey. Children respond to the way their parents worship God. And so when we look at Saul's life, he has some deceit in his heart. He wanted to take David out and so this wasn't new for him. This wasn't like a new spirit of deception. This is a, a life, this was a life practice that his daughter had watched along the way. And likewise, I think Micah probably has some conflicted thinking based upon what she saw growing up. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and attended by her five female servants, went to David's messengers and became his wife. David also married Ahinoam of Jezreel and they both were his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Mihail, David's wife, to Patiel, son of Leish, who was from Galim. Well, it's never just David's story, is it? He interacts actually with many women, many wives, many concubines, although nothing close to the count that his son Solomon will have. And so um, the women in David's life are quite important. They tend to guide his life in many ways. These aren't sidebar stories with the women in David's life. They're important to his development as a man and as a king. And they tend to reveal often his less impressive qualities. Then you have 2 Samuel chapter 3, where Michael appears again. And in this case, what happens is her father Saul, in pursuit of David, takes her away from David and gives her to another man. It's a very wicked thing that he's done. There should be no question that that's the case. But you, my, Michael is more or less, again, a functionary. Here's Saul using his daughter for political purposes again. Saul hands her over is because he's advised that, like, David should be considered dead 
the wife should be married off because he had he should be considered dead because he's rebelled. He's trying to give David a, um, you know. You know, just on a human uh, level, anybody that's been pushed around as much as she had and used and, and what have you, uh, she's got to be bitter about it. And I think, you know, uh, David at this point has already resolved, you know, I'm not sure he loves her anymore. Uh, I think he did love her. And after everything that's taken place, I think perhaps, you know, Saul marrying her off to somebody else and, and what have you, and David being left out of the picture and told that he was dead, and so on and so forth. I, I'm thinking that David may have said to himself, did she cooperate with this or not? How'd this go? There's no indication that David loved Michal, but there is definitely a statement that she loved him. Um, and anytime I see that in scripture, my heart kind of stops because it would seem that it was a one-sided love. Granted, later in his life, David will call for the return of Michal after he's 14 years apart from her. Um, but even then, it's more political than it is passionate. We show no indication that David loved Michal so far. Understanding custom and culture again, I have learned, uh, especially the more I study the word and try to really understand the heart that I am dealing in a, in a custom culture that I am not familiar with. And so what may have been just a simple exchange, um, to me in my culture says, oh my goodness, you know, she must have went out of her mind when it could have been just like, well, hey, this is, I knew this was coming and it was happening now. From a practical standpoint, anytime you tell me your heart to someone, we emotions haven't changed in the thousands of years we've been on earth. It's always been the tradition of society for a woman in traditional society, for a woman to put a lot of her worth attached to a man. And so even though it was customary in biblical times, in particular the Old Testament for men to have numerous wives or concubines. I think Michael knew that she was taking a chance, but as taking a chance, she also knew that she would have some uh, credentials, some affirmation of being, of belonging. And we all have the need to belong. Then Abner sent messages on their behalf to say to David, whose land is it? Make an argument with me and I will help you bring all Israel over to you. Good, said David, I will make an agreement with you, but I demand one thing of you. Do not come into my presence unless you bring Mihail, daughter of Saul, when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, son of Saul, demanding, Give me my wife, Mihail, whom I betrothed to myself for the price of a hundred Philistine foreskin. So Isbosheth gave orders and had her taken away from her husband, Paltiel of Laish. Her husband, however, went with her, weeping behind her all the way to Bahurim. And then we see the years go by, the years that her father marries her to a man named Paltiel, no indication that she loved Paltiel, though what's interesting is it's clear Paltiel loved her because when she is taken away from him, he is moaning and groaning and crying and gnashing of teeth and he's finally dismissed. Then Abner said to him, go back home. So he went back. He loved Michal, no indication that Michal ever loved Paltiel. Whether she still carried a torch for David is hard to say. 14 years is a really long time. If we could assume that perhaps at the start of this party she was 14, maybe 16, women were typically married by 13, so she was young. Well, now she's more of a woman of 30, very young to us, old in that time and place, particularly because she never had any children. The one thing a woman wanted to do in that time and place was give her husband sons. But she didn't give sons to Paltiel, 
and she didn't give sons to David. And so her heart was full of disappointment, regret, a sense of unimportance. Her father was dead. Her husband was dead to her for a long time. So by the time David brought her back, well, Michal was a different woman. She was a broken woman. She was, in many ways, a used woman. Used by her father, in some ways used by David, brought in at the end for political purposes. Oh yeah, we can definitely sympathize, if not empathize, with Michal. So we have all of these different moments and emotions with David and Michael, but at the end of the day, love is love and attraction is attraction. But just because you love someone doesn't mean that they're going to reciprocate you with the love that you're giving. I love the saying that says the only love you keep is the love you give away. So I love Michael because she was willing to love. She was willing to put herself out there. But she also knew that she felt some kind of way about some of the things David was doing. And so uh, as we talk about the discipline of the faith and the discipline of spiritual formation, formation cannot occur without having another person involved in your life. And so their whole relationship was formative. Second Samuel chapter 6, this is the great story where David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. Now King David was told, the Lord has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the Ark of God. So David went to bring the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fatted calf. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sounds of trumpets. The Ark of the Covenant was coming home after being misused, and uh, it meant that the power of God was back amongst the Jewish nation, which was always important to them. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Mihail, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. And if you want to secure your capital city, the way you do that is by bringing the footstool of God himself into that city. And David succeeds in doing that. But Michael is, unfortunately and sadly for her, she doesn't get it. She's still representing Saul's house. Despite the fact that she's done nice things for David and that she loves David and she's been a faithful wife to David and he now has her, she's up in the she's up in the in the high rise, David's high rise, and she's watching David as he dances before the ark as he's bringing it into Jerusalem. And it's very interesting how the story is told of Michael at this point because of the way it characterizes her. It says that she's looking through the lattice work of the window. What you would have in a fancy place like she had, would be lattice work, much like you would see even today. And so she's peering through this lattice work like this, looking down, and then uh, that is a characterization in the Old Testament of someone who is, um, how shall we say it, a woman of ill repute. They look through the lattice work, okay? And it's, so it's characterizing her in this way. She's, she's stumbled. She's not what she ought to be. And then to prove that characterization of her, she scolds David. One of the challenges in scripture is we get what people say and what they do, but we don't get what they think or what they feel, at least not very often. So you have to be careful not to read in something that scripture doesn't give us. However, the words tell us a great deal. It says she despised him in her heart. And so there is an example in scripture where we are given someone's feelings, someone's thoughts, very clearly. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in his place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. For the, the sacrifices. 
And by the way, sacrifice in 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 Hebrew is korban. The root of that word is karov, kuf, resh, bet, which literally means to draw near. So the idea was never really about the bloody animal. The idea was about how do we draw near to a being that we cannot understand. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person and the whole crowd of Israel, both men and women. And all the people went to their homes. And one of the great things in Bible stories is this, that when writers write, they write with such economy, that is, they write so little about massive things, that when they stick something in there, it's very seldom just in there for detail. And there are a number of places in the historical books, as well as in the Pentateuch, where people celebrate, okay? And a lot of times the celebrating comes with eating. Uh, this, we, we have a hard time connecting with this as modern Western people because we eat so much all the time. Well, that's not the way it was in ancient Israel. In ancient Israel, when you had a feast, it was a very special thing because you were having to watch how much food you ate because there wasn't much food either available or you couldn't afford it or it would rot or whatever it may be. But when they would have big parties, then this means that they are celebrating the blessings of God. And so you have to pay attention to that. And the celebration of eating is something that we probably need to regain. But um, it's a difficult thing for modern people to do because again, we just have so much food available to us when people in the ancient world did not. When David returned home to bless his household, Mihail, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls and of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Mihail, It was for the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. It's a pretty caustic uh, scene where David is is dancing in ecstasy really with you know before the ark and he sees it as himself dancing for God. Michal does not and Michal thinks he's disgraced himself because it does say that he's wearing I think the scripture says that David danced his clothes off. <laughs> when David was dancing, he was wearing a loincloth. Intentionally, he wasn't wearing anything. Uh... <laughs> I personally believe that what he did was he had on the humble priestly linen gown. The Jew rabbi would tell you. And I thought, did, I, I don't know, loincloth? Like, he was not, um, he was like, not dancing naked, but but scantily clad, dancing in the streets, the king, you know, um, in front of all the people. And you know, David is described as gorgeous everywhere. Um, and I think Michal is, is, uh, doesn't like the way the people are looking at him. All the women, the servants, everybody is cheering and dancing as David is coming forward. Now, Mikhail is not down there, and you might say, well, goodness, why not? How disrespectful. No, actually, it was the other way around. A woman of her stature would have stayed in the palace and waited for her husband to come to her. So she doesn't get in any trouble whatsoever, not being down at the party. But when he comes in, she does not greet him and say, oh, David, I'm so proud of you. Oh, praise to the Lord. None of that kind of language. How? King David has distinguished himself today. Well, I'm sorry, but there's just no way to read that, except in the way she said it, because she was being very demeaning, very dismissive. She was not impressed. She doesn't think well of him. She doesn't speak well of him. And it's very clear what the attitude is of her heart 
because of how David responds to her. David scolds back at her and says, I am going to humble myself more than ever in the future, unlike your house, your father's house, the house of Saul. And so now she is seen as an opponent. I will debase myself further. I don't care. All I care about is God. And his difference in how she was speaking lets us know the true attitude of her heart. Much as we really want Michal to be spared, to be loved, to be given a second chance, nothing she has done makes her worthy of that. And David sees that. It's really, it's a powerful scene. You can see them. Um, you know, she's very sarcastic, actually. You know, didn't the king of Israel, in Hebrew you can you can feel the, the sarcasm as well, do himself honor today. So sarcastic, right? Exposing himself in the sight of his slave girls, of his subjects, as one of the riffraff might expose himself. But David answers, it was before God who chose me instead of your father and all his family. Which is also a bit like reminding her, really? God doesn't think that I'm a disgrace. God thinks your father is, you know, and appointed me ruler over God's people. I will dance before God and dishonor myself even more and be low in my own esteem. But among the slave girls that you speak of, I will be honored. Meaning, I'm not worried about what the riffraff think. I'm dancing for God. And, you know, just like, it's not often that the Tanakh like, has us privy to a, a marital squabble in such um, colorful narration. Chastising him in front of all those people, wrong. If she, if, if she had taken him aside, you know, and they had visited about this, he could have explained, she could explain, obviously they could have probably settled the issue. But in the end, what she did was, she, she pitted him against God. You know, I think um, I think part of it is again, it's it's this dichotomy that it created. Um, it is this, it is it is a, a scenario that we see all too often, not just in church, but in in so many areas of the life where someone takes on this authority uh, assignment to then deem what it is that you should do and you should not do. Now, and here's the interesting thing. Is she completely wrong? Is her assessment completely wrong? I mean, you are king. You have to set some example. We read it in our head in the tone that we think she's saying it in. But is that completely accurate? Could she not have said, oh my goodness, you're the king. What will they think? Is it, why is it that we read it in this such disdain voice and we, we have this look of who she is in our heads and we create, and that's kind of the challenge when we read scripture because our understanding of who the characters were is only shaped by people that we see today. So when we read Micah, we read David, we already assign them somebody that we know. Oh, that sounds like this one. And so she takes the face of this one that we see. That sounds like something she would say. And now all those characteristics, characteristics of people that we know fall into this Bible character who we never met, who we have very limited information about. So we scrap away all of that. We extract all of that and just bare bones. Here is a wife that is saying to her husband, hey, husband, remember who you are. You know, people are looking. And here's the husband saying, listen, don't tell me what to do. Okay, so is she completely wrong? Maybe not. What we take from the story though, is that the purity of it without understanding her intent or motives is that there is a place in God that if we are honest and true and surrender to it, that could have us stretch outside of the confines and the comforts of what we know. And that's the end of the chapter. It's like, and that's all she wrote, you know. Um, 
it's, it's as though that was the fight, and from that moment on, they didn't sleep together, and she was cursed. The, the rabbis understand to her, her dad been cursed for berating her husband. Now, it could be that she decided she didn't want to have children, right? Like, a, a feminist read on this would be that she was like, that she said no. What does the end of her story look like? It doesn't look good. It says for the rest of her day, she never had children. In the Old Testament, when we read that, that's usually a pretty strong statement about where they stood in their relationship with the Lord. We can look at other stories with Leah and Rachel. God said, the Lord opened Leah's womb, but Rachel's not. And that was a statement at that time, not to worry, God also opened Rachel's womb a little farther down the story. But at the time that Leah went crying out to God and God saw that Leah was not loved, God answers Leah's pain by opening her womb. And she praised him for it. This time, I will praise the Lord, Leah said. Well, we never hear those words from Michal. We never hear, this time I will praise the Lord. We never hear, maybe God sees my pain. She just doesn't really talk about the Lord at all. And so it would seem, in the end, she loved her father. She loved her father's gods. David is the one who is a man after God's own heart, but not Saul and not his daughter Michal. The political, national purpose is, of course, to say that David's family is not corrupted. His descendants are not coming from this mixing of the tribe of Benjamin, Saul, and David's tribe, Judah. It's rather, it's pure. Michael, who had the potential of having children, we would assume, uh, doesn't because she has now, with her house, the house of Saul, under God's curse. And um, we don't know exactly what happened to her, it doesn't say whether this meant that she just was barren or that this meant that David rejected her. Well, I think in her case, uh, uh, she needs to reflect on the fact that she had the opportunity to be one of the women in the Bible that would be remembered forever as, as one of the most positive forces behind the king they loved. But she forfeited that in what took place. And, and that, uh, you know, obviously, the, the real sinew of all of this, can people who get outside the will of God get back in? Yes, unless in this case, you can be as sorry as you want to, but you got cursed. And does God carry those things out? Yeah. But in the end, who knows? Maybe, uh, you know, she had done some good things in the meantime. Like the Bible doesn't record everything that's ever taken place. And so maybe as a result of everything that took place, she had. But, but had she, understood what was really going on and the problem is obviously that David was a man of God Michael was a man of God's plural right Michael loved I believe the things that made her happy not necessarily the Lord the things and so so she uh, was a person who was very humanistic I believe at heart running after a man who had a heart for God. Michael died with no children. What is your take on that? Mm. That's a good question. So? <laughs> she was still a woman. She was still whole. She was still a child of God. Uh, Having a child doesn't define you. It's just a blessing. But uh, take for myself, we have one daughter. And after that one daughter, I was like, oh. Like when she was two or three years old, I was like, oh, okay, I'm ready to have another one. Because when I, we first had her, I was like, that's it. But then after I tried to have another child, I couldn't. And I was very disappointed and very broken but to a blessing that God gave me was he gave me numerous spiritual daughters. 
And I've had times when I felt so close to my spiritual daughters, I was feeling like some kind of way, like this is like too good to be true. So just because you don't have a child doesn't make you an incomplete woman. Sometimes when we look at the stories in the Bible that are painful to read, we can think, well, I thought we served a good God. This is not good. And I understand that. And I think as someone who tries to encourage people and minister to people who are hurting, you got to be really careful about saying, let me show you how good God is. He hurt this person and he killed that person. And he wiped out this person because that's not the story you need to be telling. Sometimes we just need to say, God loves you, and here's how we know that's true. And then with no difficulty whatsoever, you're going to find stories in Scripture of God loving the unlovable, forgiving the unforgivable, cherishing those who do not cherish themselves. There's a time and place for looking at the hard stories of the Bible. Absolutely. When your faith is ready, I promise you can handle it. But when your faith is tenuous, when it's hanging by a thread, this is the time when you come with the comforting good news of the mercy of God. And believe me, it is all through the Bible. Anytime you deal with a story in the Bible, you need to realize that the writers, the human writers, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, are leaving out much more than they're putting in. I mean, the life of a person like Michael was much more complicated than what you get in the book of Samuel. Uh, the life of David, same thing. He, there were a lot more things that happened in his life than is in the book of Samuel. Uh, Saul as well. All the characters were just getting little snippets here and there. And even when they focus in on one event, they're barely telling you much at all about that one event. So writers are always selective when they write. That's true of every single writer because you can't say everything when you say anything. If you try, you'll never say anything because you're always saying everything else. You can never end writing the story. You gotta shorten it down. And the principle here that's important to realize is this, is that the way they make their selections of what they're going to say is according to the purpose that they have for that story. The story is designed to show that David has learned his lesson from his failure on the first attempt to bring the ark in. You see what a good king he is? And Saul's family, is Michael, is entirely discredited because she didn't learn the lesson. And of course, 2 Samuel 6, that story of bringing the ark in, the very next story is 2 Samuel chapter 7, when God makes covenant with David. So every bit of selectivity that's going on is designed to make, to help you get the point. And it's really unfortunate that sometimes we, we think that Bible stories tell us everything you could possibly want to know about an event. And of course, then we run into it and we say, well, wait a minute, what about this? What about that? But the purpose is not to be asking, what about this? What about that? That might be interesting to us, but our question has to be, what was interesting to the writer? What was that holy, divinely inspired writer? What was his purpose? And this is the artistic value of the writing. They're selective, they emphasize certain things, and the ways they describe those things are very artistic for a purpose. And the purpose is what we're going after so we can align our thoughts to the purposes of these ancient writers. So it's the same story played over and over again, that there is this love, there's the love that calls Micah to lie, and then turn around and say, well, he threatened. There's the deception, Adam and Eve. It's the same cycle over and over again. How does that relate to worship? There's the love, and then there's the deception that God has to forgive us over and over again because Worship can sometimes be selfish. What does that mean? That means that it that part of worship, especially in the cultural confines that we have, presents somewhat of a selfishness. That I want worship services to be confined to what appeases me. 
not so much what pleases him. Not too loud. Louder. Not too long. Ooh, that's too short. Not that song. Oh, I love that song. You see, it has become a dynamic that makes us comfortable. Because in order for me to worship him, I have to be comfortable. So don't let me stand too long. Ugh. Oh, I just raised my hands. I just clapped. I don't know this song. I don't like this song. This song too slow. This song too old. It was never for you in the first place. So now that I've now denoted this worship to selfishness, now let's take it to Mike and David. What are you doing? Well, part of her first mistake is that what he's doing was never meant for you in the first place. So had she taken a breath, a beat and said, this is something to me and God, let me stay out of this. She did, which is what we do today. So we can't follow it because we're guilty of it too. The characters in the Tanakh, I believe what, what gives them so much texture and makes them the most interesting and useful to us as humans living in the world, reading about them, is how imperfect they are. So again, I've never, I never studied um, David in yeshiva in like a very traditional orthodox context, where maybe he's, he's made out to be much more flawless. But in liberal context, He's like um, an adulterer. He kills off the husband of Bacheva, right? He, I mean, like, you know, he's so far from perfect. And Michal, you know, I don't know. I can't say that I can tell you the, the message. Just like when you started and you said, well, what is Judaism? What, what's the take on God? There isn't such a thing. You know, our takes on God have to do with what we need in the moment. Like sometimes we call God parent and sometimes we call God ruler because sometimes we need a God that's more proximate and sometimes we need a God that's more imminent. So, you know, rabbinic literature with women and probably also men, but certainly with women in, in uh, the Hebrew Bible, you have charitable and uncharitable readings. But you do have her appear later in Proverbs in this very famous poem known as Eshet Chayil. You have a verse that's devoted to her that says, her husband is prominent in the gates and he sits among the elders of the land. It's, it's a whole ode to an Eshet Chayil, to a woman of valor. And it's as though she's, a, she's clearly, according to the rabbis, mentioned there. So it's definitely not as though the rabbis write her out and make her out to be some sort of monster at all. However, they do seem see her as having, to some extent at least, been, been punished. My heart goes out to Michal, first of all. You know, it's like, she's like, I don't know if she's David's second choice, but it's like almost like David didn't care. He just got whatever woman, he had no say in it, really. So in that sense, I'm actually, I'm moved by Michal because she gets what she wants. She loves him and she gets him. How it happened, we don't know, quite frankly. But my own personal take is she's a woman who's very self-possessed. And maybe to a fault and maybe in ways that hurt her. But she is strong. And she's passionate. And it's not every woman in the, in the Bible that you get to see their passion. That you hear that they love and you hear their distaste. It says she loved him and later it says she hated him. She's a woman of extremes. She feels deeply and the Bible cares to tell us. In order to live our best life, in order to live a life that desires to be obedient to Christ, we have to know what God's word says about our life. We have to understand things like the Ten Commandments. We have to understand the stories like Michael and David 
and Saul. And we have to, to, to wrestle with these stories to see what is God really saying here? We have to understand why Abraham would say that Sarah was his sister. Like, why would he do something like that? So that the Bible lets us know that there's nobody perfect. And when you look at the life of David, and God says there's, there's nobody after my heart like David, this is, this is a heart that God put into David. God put that heart in David. And he put that heart in David before he was born. So in order for us to know how to live our best life to the glory of God, in order for us to know how to obey, we need to know what the word says about God's principles, God's doctrines, God's promises, God's commandments to the best of our ability from Genesis to Revelation. But we also must come broken and ask like David, search me, knowing that I have tunnel vision and to allow other people uh, to have a w wisdom circle around you, to have people that are wise around you. And I'm one that firmly believes in counseling. I'm one that firmly believes in the power of spiritual director. I'm one that firmly believes in having a mentor because we all have a blind spot. She, like all the characters in the Torah, will be interpreted and be reinterpreted forever. Please God, as befits the moment or the woman who is um, who's reading her and needing to draw wisdom from the story. I think one of the most fascinating parts of Samuel or dimensions of the book of Samuel is not just Michael, but the contrast between Michael and Hannah. Uh, we'll start discovering some of the most important principles that the book of Samuel has for especially for our my sisters in Christ okay because Sa Hannah was the mother of Samuel and she was downtrodden she was the lowly one she was barren and she's the one that by God's mercy because of crying out for help received a child whom she knew Samuel who's going to open the gateway for the kingdom of God and for the anointed one of God to rule over the entire world. Hannah's faith, her response to God, was the means by which the gate was opened for a prophet to appear, Samuel. And what did Samuel do? He took the blessing of God and the spirit of God away from Saul and gave it to David, who is the, fam the head of the family, the royal family, that's going to rule over the entire world. That's our King Jesus. Um, you can see the contrast. The first chapters of 1 Samuel open with Hannah, who's barren, having a child who opens the way for the kingdom of God. Here's Michael, who was potentially the mother of the descendants of David that would sit on the throne. But how does her life end in the book of Samuel? The opposite of Hannah. Hannah started off barren, had a child. Michael had the potential of being the one, but she ended up barren for the rest of her life. The contrast is remarkable. And what's the difference between them? What made the difference is that principle that's all through the book of Samuel. And that is that those who are faithful to the Lord will receive his blessing and he will lift up the lowly. But those who are proud and haughty like Michael was, he will bring them down. And so if there's anything that we need to learn from the life of Michael by contrasting her with the other major woman in this book, Hannah, it is that we need to be the humble people whom God will lift up. And we need not to be the proud people whom God will for sure one day bring down. Well, I confess, when I started out with bad girls of the Bible, first of all, I had 20 bad girls and only squeezed 10 into the first book. Um, and one of the reasons we're drawn to them, it's our human nature, sadly, to want to focus on what's negative, to want to focus on what's bad. It's who we are. But what I discovered in studying all 10 of the women <laughs> is I had something in common with all 10 of them. I think I was expecting to point fingers 
Oh, look at her. She is so bad. And instead, it was, <gasps> I do that. Oh, and uh, yep, I've done that. And oh my goodness, I think I did that yesterday. And so we have to take the whole of their lives and the whole of their personalities. And we have to be really honest with ourselves. Some of these women offer a cautionary tale, no question. But the reason they're in the Bible is why we study them. Not to point fingers and say, wow, aren't they bad? But to imagine how we might be just the same and to understand however bad man might be or woman, we serve a really good God. Because it's the graciousness and goodness of God that shines in these stories more than the badness of people. It's his story in the end. It's his grace and his mercy that we're really looking for. Toward the end of Michael's relationship with David, she had a broken heart. She was disappointed. She felt rejected and insecure, which is so common for women at large. Because when we look at society, the center of society is a male, and most often a white male. That's the center, if we look at a circle. And outside of that circle would be the white female, and then the black male, and then the black female. So then the woman becomes marginalized. So for Michael, uh, her dad was the center. And then David was next, and she thought she was next, and she was next for a while. But when other relationships and other positions of authority creeped into the life and the relationship she had with she and David, even David growing closer to God, she felt more pushed to the margins as a marginalized woman. You know, it's interesting, and I've always said this over the 40 years that, that I counseled, uh, that we are all designed differently, but we act just alike. And so what happens is, you know, somebody goes and says, well, now I get to see this happen to me, I already know pretty much what the answer is going to be, because, well, I've seen that before, right? So even though they're different, and, and they're going to have to be healed differently, the same thing has happened to various other people as well. So we're different, but we're alike. It's not my place to denote what is a true worshiper, because I will never be able to peek into your heart to see, is your heart pure to worship the king? That's his job, not mine. And so because of that, the residual of that causes us to judge what we think is true and not true, what is true expression and what is flesh and all of that. That brings on the scorn and the disdain. But at the end of the day, we, when we look at David's story, we understand that that is a part of worship. That, that comes with the territory. And to not get sidetracked by somebody else's opinion about how you should honor the one that you love. Wouldn't it be a shame that you wouldn't give a gift to your husband based off of the opinion of someone else because they didn't deem him worthy enough? And you're looking at them and saying, do you understand what we've been through? And you're going to try to diminish the gift that I give him based off of your limited knowledge of our relationship? Please, I'll become even more undignified than this. I'll get him something even bigger. I'll get him something even greater. Because I need for you to understand that anything that you say, anything that you do, no matter how you look at me, will never devalue what I feel for him because you don't understand what this relationship is based off of. I love uh, Proverbs 20 and five. It says, counsel in the heart of a person is like deep water, but a person of understanding will, will draw it out. So get around people that can draw out the depths of your soul. If Michael was sitting here with me today, I'm just gonna imagine her sitting over there and I'm going to imagine her being five years old. And I would ask her to share with me her
her experience as a child with her mom and dad. I would ask her about her teenage years and I would ask her what attracted her to David so much. And even though she went through some turbulence in her life, I, was a I would ask her if she felt that God was still with her even in the difficult times. Even though she didn't have a child, do you still believe that God is with you and that God loves you? Because at the end of the day, of the, day the most important discipline is knowing that God loves you. And in order to embrace that love, there has to be an intentionality of receiving that love. And every day I try to receive that love. And out of receiving that love, I try to give that love back to God through worship. And then I receive love for myself. And it's out of love for God and love for myself that I'm able to fulfill the great commandment to love my neighbor as myself. And I think that's what the world is missing. It's a love ethic and a love deficit because we're in a world that can't give us what they don't have. And so love is the foundation for everything. Amen.